Good evening. This is Frank Knight. Before introducing this evening's discussion, let's take a look at a night baseball game at New York's Yankee Stadium. Do you know that all umpires of the major baseball leagues, the American and the National, this year, as for years past, use Longines watches exclusively for timing all games, including the World Series. The fact is that Longines watches are official for timing championship sports in all fields throughout the world. Longines is the official watch for the United States Olympic Committee, for the American Automobile Association, for the National Aeronautic Association, the American Powerboat Association, and many other national and international sports and contest groups. Now, why is this so? The answer is found in the greater accuracy which is inbuilt into every Longines watch. Accuracy, not as an empty claim, but as an established fact, proven year after year in the competitive accuracy trials at the great government observatories. For excellence, for elegance, for greater accuracy and long life. Throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. The Longines chronoscope each week looks for the truth in the vital issues of the hour. And here to discuss these issues are our co-editors. Mr. Henry Hazlitt, a political economist of respected judgment, and contributing editor of Newsweek magazine, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Max Thornburg, wartime petroleum advisor to the Department of State and expert on Middle Eastern affairs. In this spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion, the opinions are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Thornburg, in addition to having been the advisor to the petroleum advisor to the State Department, what's been your experience in the oil industry? <clears throat> I spent something more than 25 years with uh, Standard Oil Company of California as an engineer, a refinery manager, chief engineer of the company, and vice president of the merger we formed with the Texas Company for Eastern Hemisphere Developments. What's been your experience in the Middle East? I've spent the greater part of the past 16 years living and working in the Middle East or in close connection with its problems. Well, you were, you were advisor, aren't you, to the Shah? For the of, last uh, five Iran? years, I have been most of the time in Persia as advisor to the Persian government, yes. Mr. Thornburg, let's get to the bottom of this nationalization crisis in Iran. What are the basic failures underlying this crisis? Well, the uh, oil nationalization uh, itself uh, is not, in my opinion, the principal thing that is wrong in Persia. So to get to the basis of it, we have to go back of oil nationalization. Oil nationalization itself is a very serious and important thing that is wrong. Is it a British failure, first of all? The British have, uh, in my opinion, contributed to what has gone wrong in Persia. But uh, a good many things went wrong before we were faced with oil nationalization. The British have, uh, of course, had interest in that part of the world for 150 years, and uh, they have uh, exercised their influence in controlling the politics of Persia for uh, a great many years. Well, now, two weeks ago, we had uh, Lloyd Wilmot of the present British government on this particular program. He told us that the Iranians had uh, realized vast benefits from the Anglo-Iranian contract. Uh, do you agree with that view? I wouldn't say that uh, there hadn't been uh, vast benefits realized, but they've been realized by a very small part of the people of Persia, perhaps by 1% or something of that sort. Well, how have the British failed specifically now? Well. The British have uh, unquestionably, in my view, interfered with the political life of the country in such a way that as uh, to make it impossible for the Shah to develop a really responsible government in his country, one that would look after the welfare of the people. That is one way in which the British have uh, brought about this crisis that faces us today. 
Well, Mr. Thornburg, now that we have this crisis, and now that the Iranian government has rejected out of hand the decision of the Hague Court, of the International Court of Justice, what is the next step that, the Brit that Britain can take? What is the next step that the Atlantic nations can take? I don't believe that any step that anyone takes aimed directly at this uh, oil nationalization itself is going to cure the situation in Persia. What is wrong in Persia is that there is no government over there that is responsible to deal with. Now, you ask what is likely to happen. Uh, there is virtually a state of anarchy today in Persia, and you cannot <coughs> forecast what anarchy is going to do. One of the things that might happen would be a general revolution of the people. It might be uh, 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 that they would uh, kill uh, a considerable number of the British operators that are in there. There might be a religious uh, uprising. There might be a communist uprising. Anything of that sort could happen today when there's no strong government there to control things. Coming well, back to the causes of this unrest, this situation that you described, uh, are the Russians uh, partially the cause of it? I wouldn't say that the Russians are uh, really the cause of any important trouble in Persia today. They are going to be the only ones who benefit from what's going wrong over there. Well, that was something I was just going to ask. Isn't the immediate effect that the oil has been in effect lost to the West for the time being, and isn't it quite probable, or isn't the danger very great, that it will fall into the hands of Russia within a year or so? Unless uh, a sound government is established in the country very soon, in my opinion, we will lose Persia to the communists. Then they'll get the oil along with the rest of it. Well, you, you uh, have there been American failures here too? We've spoken of the British failures. Have there also been American failures to, or American contributions to this present state of anarchy? The uh, American government has only very recently taken any interest in the Middle East, you see, since we had our own oil developments over there in the last 10 or 15 years. And we really have never developed a policy toward the Middle East or toward Persia. Now, in the last two years, I would say that our failure, our government's failure to recognize what is taking place in Persia, which could have been seen so clearly and must have been seen by our embassy there, is to a considerable extent responsible for this crisis that has suddenly come onto us. Well, let me ask you this, sir. Uh, we are, are we more successful than the British in our operations in the Middle East? I mean, uh, our oil operations. Our oil operations. Then how, how is it that we are more successful? What have we done with our oil operations that the Anglo-Iranian has not done? Well, the, uh, the two principal American oil concessions in the Middle East, in Bahrain and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, have had no trouble of any sort. Uh, in the first place, uh, they have been ready to adjust their royalty payments to the governments and have done it during this past year voluntarily. They've increased them very substantially. And the British have not done that? The British have not done that. They, they have been negotiating for two years, but uh, never uh, due to the company's own fault, in my opinion, uh, never came to an agreement. Are you speaking of British policy generally or simply of Anglo-Iranian policy? I am uh, glad you asked that because uh, what I'm speaking of is Anglo-Iranian oil company policy, not uh, British foreign policy generally. But the British government owns uh, the majority of the stock in Anglo-Iranian. The British government owns uh, 52 or 53 percent, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, the Foreign Office or the British government has left the management of the company in the hands of its uh, commercial board of directors. Well, Mr. Thornburg, doesn't this whole incident uh, throw rather a, uh, an ominous light on point four? Uh, that is to say, how can you have a system of loans to foreign governments of this sort when the property or whatever is there can be seized and nothing in particular can be done to rescue the property once it's taken over? Well, that uh, does raise quite a question, but uh, I think all the nations in the world recognize the sovereign right of any government to nationalize private property in the public interest, provided it's compensated for to the former owners. 
Well, shouldn't the compensation be such as not to scare away future investors? After all, isn't it in the interest of Iran, as of any backward nation, to attract the maximum amount of foreign private capital for development? Isn't that what it chiefly needs? And doesn't it have to reassure investors in order to get that? Yes. Of course, from that point of view, it's unfortunate that this uh, tragically unnecessary accident of oil nationalization ever took place. Well, the, the, uh, the Persians who uh, have led the country into oil nationalization, I am perfectly sure, never had the slightest intention of nationalizing that oil industry. That, uh, that as I say, was an accident pushed onto them uh, through the, uh, the inept handling of the negotiations by the company. Well, can Mossadegh produce oil? Can he be make no, good on No, I this? don't believe that the Persians can uh, operate any part of their oil industry, which means that unless some solution is found, the I oil industry will shut down. I think this point, sir, should be brought out. And since you are something of an expert on these nationalization problems, what do you find that's hopeful in the picture now? Now, what is our solution? I don't see much that is hopeful in the oil picture itself. The hope that I do see is almost entirely in this fact that Persia has in, the, in its ruler, the Shah, a young man of admirable qualities who for several years has been trying to establish a decent government in his country. You are an advisor to the Shah, I believe. That's right. And you I have been. I am yes. not now. I see. Are you impressed with his sincerity and his ability? Very impressed, yes. And you think he is the hopeful factor? He certainly is. Now, if uh, the Shah had the support of the British government and of our government... Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Thornburg, but I'm afraid our time is up. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. The editorial board for this edition of the Nongene Chronoscope was Mr. Henry Hazlitt and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our guest was Mr. Max Thornburg, the noted authority on Middle Eastern affairs. Throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longine, the world's most honored watch. Honored for excellence and elegance by 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medal awards a record unmatched by any other watchmaker, and winner of more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. For any occasion, the world's most honored gift is Longines, the world's most honored watch. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. Next week, at this same time, over the CBS television network, the Longines Whitnor Watch Company will again present the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the vital issues of the hour. This is Frank Knight, speaking for Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines, both sold and serviced by more than 4,000 leading jewelers from coast to coast who proudly display the emblem, Agency for Longine Whitnor Watches. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.